cover very briefly, and then we'll, we'll focus in on, on some things. Okay? So, first of all, examples of John's long narratives. We talked about John 5 to 12 yesterday, I think, or the day before, didn't we, with the, uh, the trial, the, the accusation in chapter 5 that is still there. That's the spring. It's still there in the autumn. That's still the, the tension in Jerusalem uh, by 7 and 8. Uh, then you go through 9, 10, second half of 10. We're into the winter time. The tension is still there with the leaders. Uh, by 11, the raising of Lazarus in February, roughly. That's the real last thing. They just cannot take it anymore. And there's that great conversation where the, uh, the leaders, the Sanhedrin, are discussing the problem of Jesus and the fact that he's raised Lazarus from the dead. And they say, hey, just imagine it. I, I want to watch the DVD in heaven. This is one on my list of DVDs I want to watch. I want to watch the conversation they had. If you've ever been in a committee, you know, when you have a group of people trying to plan something, it can get a little bit strange. And I, I just want to see that moment where somebody says, I know, let's kill him. Let's kill Lazarus as well as Jesus. That will solve our problem. And the look on everybody else's face, I wonder if anybody in the room thought about that. Jesus just raised Lazarus from the dead. That's a problem, so let's kill him. <laughs> You'd think that someone in the committee would say, hang on, <laughs> isn't there a problem with your plan? But they went for it because they were so angry with Jesus. Let's kill Jesus, let's kill Lazarus, we've got to deal with this problem. So that by the time you come into chapter 12, Jesus is arriving in Jerusalem and the leadership is looking for their opportunity. And so Judas is the opportunity. Now what, what's the issue with Judas? Just as we're thinking flow of, of John's gospel, what is it that makes Judas want to betray Jesus? Because only John tells us. If we only had Matthew, Mark and Luke, we would be scratching our heads thinking, why has Judas gone bad? What's happened? Anybody remember? Chapter 12, maybe, John? Yeah. Is that, is that true, chapter 12? Yeah. Okay, I'm not so what, the waters. what happens in 12? Well, chapter 12, uh, you know, Jesus is anointed by Mary. Yeah. And she pours this expensive oil, and, and, and we hear the response of Judas. Yeah. And we, you know, if there is a waste, it's a waste. This money could have been given to the yes, poor or something. Say, but he didn't do it because he didn't care for the poor, but because uh, he was a thief. Yeah, is and so right? it's a comment from John. It's an explanation, which is quite rare in, in biblical narrative. The commentator or the narrator doesn't often step in and make a comment. Uh, but on that occasion, he does. Judas was in charge of the money bag, and he used to help himself from it. And so you go, ooh. So that incident where... This woman's devotion is so extreme to Jesus and Judas just sees the money that's just gone down the drain. So there's a money stimulus there, but there's also a devotion stimulus. And those two things, if uh, remember what Jesus talked about way back in chapter 5 with the Pharisees and the, the, the leaders, you do not have the love of God within you because you look for glory from one another. And there's this glory from God or from each other, love from God for each other or no love. You know, it's just sort of one or the other. And there's this tension there. And, and what kind of man is Judas? Does he have the love of God within him? Is he responsive to Jesus? You know, no, because if he was, he'd be delighted that this woman just showed Jesus lots of love. But it bothered him. And so when, when does that develop fully? It's in the next section, in chapter 13. And it's an interesting thing, if you look at it in, in 13, what's going on there? There's, it's not a money discussion, although he's had a money discussion. You know, I've just lost uh, 50,000 pounds in a fraud, but I've got a chance to, to get 1,000 pounds from this other thing. When you lose money, you start grabbing for it, right? And so he's grabbing for money. They're, the Sanhedrin are offering him money if he can deliver Jesus to them. But why does he leave when he leaves in chapter 13? What's going on in John 13? Do you remember? Famous chapter. Uh -huh. washing, washing. washing the feet, which is an act of devotion and love. And it's, it's like, if you read, as you read through John 13, if you read it from Judas' perspective, 
it's as if there is no oxygen in the room for him. All of this love, I mean, it's just disgusting. Jesus wrapping himself with a towel, oh my goodness. Because he doesn't love Jesus, he's not captured by it. And it's just so offensive to him because he loves himself. And here, Jesus doesn't love himself. Jesus gives himself away. And the tension that creates for him, mm-hmm. I think it just chokes him. It's like, oh, I can't breathe. And so he leaves. He's sort of choked out by grace mm-hmm. and goes and does what he does for, you know, to get Jesus arrested. And then, what does Jesus talk about? Now is the Son of Man glorified. So there's the glory, like, this is the moment. This is it, boys. This is happening. But then what does Jesus say? With Judas gone, who didn't belong in the group, I've got a new commandment for you. Love one another as I have loved you. By this will all men know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Why didn't he give that command while Judas was still there? Because he knew Judas wasn't a lover in that group. He didn't love. And so it's interesting how suddenly Judas is gone and Jesus is talking about glory and death and the hour and, and love. And the love for one another is the defining feature of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Now, that's a, a challenge for me because I grew up where, in a church where I'd hear references to that, just probably like all of us, as part of the preaching, right? John thirteen thirty five. By this will all men know that you are my disciples. And I always heard it as a very pragmatic, good idea. You know, like Jesus is saying, right, I've got a plan, and we're going to take over the world. And if we're going to take over the world, it's just going to work better if you love each other. You know, just, this is just a good idea. If we're going to be a conference, let's be polite to people. Just a good idea, right? And so I always kind of heard it that way until more recently, recent years, where I've, I've questioned it and, and poked it and said, hang on a second, why is that the key feature? Why is loving one another so important? Why isn't it, by this will all men know that you are my disciples if you have right theology, or if you attend the right conferences, or if you wear a cross around your neck, or if you, you know, wear Christian t-shirts, or if you listen to Christian music? Why does Jesus say love one another as if that is the, the main pre- preeminent distinguishing feature of a follower of Jesus. Any thoughts? Is it just pragmatic or is there something more going on there? Could it be that the reason that our love for each other reflects Jesus so much is because that is what defines him. So, so the, the main distinguishing feature of a follower of Jesus is the main distinguishing feature of Jesus himself. He was always getting in trouble for being loving and gracious, kind, compassionate, and even sometimes in his love, demonstrating anger, which was provoked love, right? And he was always talking about his intimacy and his connection with his father, And the ultimate glorification of the Father, where the the glory of God, Father, Son, Spirit, is revealed, is on the cross, because that's the ultimate demonstration of God who is love. I think that's the reason. It's not just a pragmatic idea of this harsh God that we should act nice. No, God is revealed in Christ, giving himself away on the cross. And so Jesus says to his disciples, look, I'm washing your feet, now you do the same thing because if you're representing me the way you love each other is going to speak a loud message to the world Tom Follow up on this is uh, what the, there's one thing that the world can copy is, is true love mm-hmm. God's love yeah. it's something that only God can give you and you only learn from him and like you said it was not, it doesn't say well God is not described as God is faith I don't know, something else yeah. But it is God describes God as love. Yeah. You know, that's how He's described. But, but Jesus is also love, and if we if we have His love, that that means that's the power to sort of change. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. The the fact that God is love is is a huge reality that we've got to 
if we don't spend time thinking about that, we're really going to struggle in everything else we do because what kind of a God, which God is God? That's the foundational number one question. And so when you go, uh, you look at Paul, for example, in the book of Acts, in all his missionary journeys and travels, two, there's only two times where he speaks to people that did not have any Bible training. All right, they, they'd never, they weren't in a synagogue, they'd never been to Sunday school, they never knew their Bibles, and that's Lystra and Athens. And if you look at those two messages that Paul preaches, Acts 14, 25 to 27, and then Acts 17, whatever, 22 to 36, um, or 16 to 32, whatever it is, Lystra and Athens, what question does he answer? Which God is God? That's the first question. Now, if, they're talk, if he's talking to people that have a Jewish background, he's, he's talking about the God that they, they already have read about. But with pagans, he doesn't say to the people in Lystra, you have an idea of God that is Zeus. Powerful, strong, judging. Let me just add some information and tell you that his real name is Yahweh. He doesn't do that. And in Athens, he doesn't say, okay, Stoics and Epicureans, you have a concept of the divine being that is in charge, that drives everything, that determines everything, and, you know, in, in light of whom we live, let me add some information. He says, no, that's ignorance. You do not have a knowledge of God because your philosophical, common sense mind will never have a true understanding of God. So starting from zero, let me tell you about the one true God. He's kind, he's patient, he's uh, uh, generous. And he's <laughs> proven, you know, that he's going to put an end to this by the raising of Jesus. But there's a, there's a character of God that's communicated in that message. And if we go with kind of an apologetic, uh, I would call it a, a poor apologetic approach with people of saying, let me build a bridge to what you believe about God already. We're going against what the Bible's doing. We've got to present the God of the Bible, and the God of the Bible is relational. And he's revealed in the Son who gives himself away. And so John's Gospel is pure, pure gold for this, because the, re the relationship between Father and Son is on every page. And we're getting a glimpse of that. Even in John 13, right at the beginning, Jesus, knowing that he had come from God and was returning to God, took a towel, you know, got down from the table, took a towel, and, and started washing feet. It's in his uh, security and his relationship with his Father that he's not self-concerned and therefore is quite happy to do the, the lowest task. So, you, you know, even as you're talking your way through it, you're actually getting into very high theology, but you don't need to put words on that. You don't need to, like we said about John Lennox, you can just say simple observations and simple teaching of the Bible, but actually you're shaping people's view of God, you're shaping their understanding, you know, and if you do enough of that, hopefully you can fix the confusion that most Christians are living in theologically. Okay, so just moving through these then. So lots to show and tell here, John 13 to 17. I mean, that's a huge section, isn't it? If you just think about it, the washing of the feet after uh, Judas leaving, the whole conversation with Peter, Judas leaves, uh, we've got all that stuff at the end we've talked about. Then the prediction of Peter's denial, which flows into chapter 14, doesn't it? Don't let your hearts be troubled, trust in God, trust also in me. And then he has the conversation with uh, Thomas, how can we know the way? I am the way. Just show us the Father, that will do, from Philip. Oh, come on, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He carries on, talks about the greater works, which I think is talking about the revelation of the Father rather than miraculous signs there in context, flowing on into the second half of 14 and the fact that he's not going to leave them alone as orphans, uh, but there's the role of the Spirit, which sets up the vine and the branches and the connection between the two, which flows into, you know, I've suffered, you're going to suffer, There's going to, you're going to have hard times at the end of 15, the world's going to hate you just like it hated me, but then 16.5, back to the Spirit again, who's coming to convict the world and to work in you and to guide you into all truth, and it's just flowing all the way through there, that's four chapters, and then after he had said these things, Jesus lifted up his hands and, uh, or his eyes to heaven and prayed, and then you get John 17, which could be a three or four week series on its own so that's a big big chunk isn't it how do we preach when you've got a section really that is 13 14 15 16 17, five chapters long and it's just flowing because if we just divide the danger is that we miss 
the connection. So that's something we need to, to think about. And then we've got individual narratives that are just long. So what, what are some of the long ones that just go on for a very long time? John 8 is an example, isn't it? John 8, 12 to 59. Have a yeah. We'll, we'll come back to that because that's that, yeah, that's what we need to wrestle with. Uh, do we do one sermon? How do we do a series? Yeah, I, I wouldn't cover that in one sermon very easily. But but then again, I'd preach the whole of John in one sermon, so you could. But that's not the only way to do it. So we need to have both, I think. So we'll come back to that. So then, what are some of the long ones? The really long individual chapters or sections in John that are just more verses than we're comfortable with. 17 is, better than 17 is what, 26 verses? Yeah. It's very packed though, isn't it? Yeah. Six. Six. Six is long, isn't it? So that's 65, 68 30. maybe, yeah. And that's a long, you got the, the feeding of the 5,000, yeah. the overnight walking on water, but then the next day the crowds are looking for him and then it's talking about the feeding and so it's all connected and it just goes on a very long time and the 10th about the sheep one chapter chapter 10 yeah. well actually where does 10 start it really starts in 9 if you, if you look at it in, in 9 where he heals the blind man mm. and then the blind man is you know, the leaders get so upset with the, the man born blind. They ask his parents. His parents are scared of them and say, oh, you ask him. They ask him. He's not scared. This man is gripped by Jesus. He's like, don't you want to become his disciples too? You know, I don't know anything, but I just know this. I was blind and now I see. Live with it. You know, I mean, he's really bold and they get really aggressive. And actually, that's the longest section in John where Jesus disappears in chapter 9. It, like 20 odd verses. There's no Jesus. That's very rare. And so Jesus is gone. The blind man is having a go at the Sanhedrin. And then Jesus comes back and they talk to him. And he basically says, so who's blind? <coughs> are you saying that, I mean, is this guy blind or are you blind? And he, he makes the connection to the spiritual thing. And then immediately goes on to talk about evil shepherds. Ezekiel 34, right? Which is what he's talking about at the start of 10. So the whole of 9 and the first half of 10 really is a chapter. That sh the chapter break is awkward. Okay, so that's a long section. Second half of 10 from verse 22 or something, Feast of Dedication, that's a different, different section, but it's still summarizing and referring back to. So that's a long, long one. Any other long ones? There's quite a few, aren't there? Five we've talked about. Six, seven, that's pretty long. So basically most of John is <laughs> really long chunks, yeah? So let's think about this for ourselves uh, in terms of questions for the preacher. What do we do with reading? Do we read the whole text, either before or during the sermon? You know, if you're preaching the Beatitudes in Matthew 5, blessed are the poor in spirit for they shall inherit, you could read that before, you could read it during, you could read it three times and people wouldn't get tired of it because it's short. But if you're preaching John 6, you have to cut out three hymns if you're going to read all of that. You know, and then all the worship people get upset. So, <laughs> yeah. It is interesting that John gives uh, an example of it. Sometimes he just rush through the text, uh, expecting that we, we are following it or we had an exercise before it. But I felt that he treats us as people who will read the Bible. Yeah. And we won't use all of our time uh, to read through these yeah. passages. Yeah. So it's interesting. I wouldn't do that, but it's just interesting that he does. But in this environment, we've been sent an email where we're told, read this oh, yeah. in a church. But then you do a series. Yeah. Maybe you can say that. Yeah. That's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Just encourage. I think one of the big reasons people in our churches don't read the Bible is because it's never suggested. They're never, you know, they're, they're never encouraged. There's no expectation. It's almost like we assume they won't, and so they don't. But yeah, I think that's a good idea. Why not? If you're in a series through a section, encourage people. Hey, if you can read this ahead of time, it's really going to help. Read it multiple times. Same section, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> 
Any other thoughts on that? Tom? Yeah, I guess, I guess what helped was to remember how the New Testament was given at first. It wasn't given that everyone has their own copy. So they would read it in the wrong church. And they would, they would get to sleep. So yeah. I think we should, we should remember that. Right. And reading, public reading is its power. power. Absolutely, yeah. It definitely does. And so public reading is, is powerful. There's a definite value to that. One of the challenges I find if you're preaching a narrative is that almost by definition, a, a narrative has tension. And if you read it, they know the end of the story. Now you might say, well, everybody knows the end of the story in my church because they've heard it before. But even so, if you're watching a movie for the second time, you don't watch the last 10 minutes first you still have the experience of going through it to get to the last 10 minutes. And so sometimes when I'm preaching a narrative, or often when I'm preaching a narrative, if I'm asked for a reading, which happens in some churches, you know, what's your reading? Give us your reading, we'll read it out before. I'll give them something else. Because I don't want the story read that I'm about to preach. Now, if it's a psalm, no problem. You know, read it out. I sometimes use uh, DVDs where... There are some from, I have from John, from Matthew, and from Acts. Yeah. I have the, the films. The visual Bible. Yeah, and just using the Bible text. Yeah. Nothing else is said. Mm-hmm. That's, that sometimes gets people to think about the text. Yeah. Uh, to imagine. Yeah, if it's a long text. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, it's a lot easier to watch John 6 on there than it is to hear it. Yeah. And th- out of those three, the John one is particularly good. <laughs> Sorry? Yeah. Matthew and Acts are okay, but John is really good. It's just a shame they use the Good News Bible for it, but <laughs> what can you do? Yeah, so that's an option if you have that. Yeah, I think that's critical. It's critical to show, for people to be able to see that what you're saying is biblical. And one way to do that is, if you've got a long section, to read certain elements within that, but when you tell the rest, tell it so well that if they've still got their Bibles open, which you hope they will, mm-hmm. they go, yeah, yeah. I, he's, he or she is saying exactly what this says. And so it's, it's, not, uh, it's not as simple as we must read every single line and then talk about it. That's actually a very dull way to present some, something. But if we tell the story, people need to be able to see, yep, oh yep, then that. So we, ha- we need to have a familiarity with the details in a story that is way beyond just having a rough idea. You know, even if you think you understand the point of the story, let's say you're preaching Zacche- um, not Zacchaeus, Nicodemus, and Jesus in John 3. Oh, I know the point is verse 16. You know, you've got to be born again. Uh, if you just kind of say, well, you know, Nicodemus came to Jesus and they had this conversation. Anyway, so here's the point. Uh, God so loved the world that he gave his only son. People are going, but what about, what about the spirit and what about the trees and what about Moses and the serpent and, and what's this quote here? Why is this in, in quotations? And you need to know it if you're going to preach it. You need to really get your arms around it so that even if you don't read it, in that case you probably would because it's, it's fairly short, but even if you were to summarize a paragraph, summarize it well. Don't just sort of avoid it because that just shows you haven't, haven't studied. You don't know what you're talking about. And, there's a, and actually, verse 16 is only really ultimately powerful because of verses 1 to 15 and maybe even 228 through to 315 so there's this all of this stuff is setting that up 
Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish. For God so loved the world. So it's, it's defined. What does it mean to believe? It's defined in the two verses right there before. What does it mean to be born again? It's defined as a spirit thing. It's not a birth canal thing. You know, so there's, there's all of that detail working through, and it's an intricate tapestry that somehow, if we're preaching it, we need to help people grasp that. And so the normal, maybe our default approach should be to say, I want to read the text because it's powerful. If I can, I want the text read, and I want it read well. And actually, something to think about is how well do we read the Bible? Because sometimes we're very good at preaching, but we read the Bible very dull. But if, if you're reading a narrative and you read it well, just think of how would you read it for children. If you read a story to children, you don't read it as if it's boring. <laughs> you know, but for adults, we sometimes think these people don't need, st- they don't need a story here. They're adults. They just need the facts. Nonsense. Well, how many adults do you know that every, t- you know, every weekend they watch a factual documentary? And how many adults do you know who watch a movie? <laughs> you know, it's way more people are into the movie. And actually, you watch a documentary, it's always a story. You know, a good documentary, they know it's got to be in story form. Advertising, I don't know how it is in your country, TV advertising. 30 years ago, I remember the adverts where the man was in the white jacket, the white uh, scientific, uh, you know, the scientist, with two buckets and the, the soap and you know the t-shirt that's still dirty and the t-shirt that's clean and it was very much a scientific presentation I don't know about your culture but in my culture they don't do that kind of advertising anymore it just doesn't work so how do you advertise someone's uh, certain soap you tell a story for 10 seconds and the story basically is simple you have a child running falls over and then the camera goes to the mother who's wearing perfectly clean clothes and she sees the grass stain and she just is completely happy. Bold or Daz or whatever, you know, Ariel. And then it goes back to the soap and you go, okay, soap equals happy mum. Grass stain, no problem. And it's a little story. Or, you know, why, instead of this car has this much brake horsepower and this much uh, fuel efficiency and all of these details... You should buy this car. No, they may tell you that information, but they'll tell you that information in the context of that car driving. And sometimes there's a story even there, like the, is it the Renault advert a few years ago where this man gets in the car and goes to this car park and picks up this woman and, and you think it's so much like an affair. And then it turns out it's his wife. It's like, okay, if you have this car, even taking your wife out is like an affair. I mean, it's just bizarre advertising. <laughs> But it works because it tells a story and people lean into it. You know, so we've got to make sure if we're telling, reading the Bible to adults, let's read it well. Pause and strong and soft and vary the voice and so on. Yeah. We had an obese actor who became a Christian. And he took, I think it was the whole of John, and learning it by heart. Yeah. Came out. That was the whole and he was he was just on, on stage yeah. with a table and a and a chair and he walked down. Yeah, I, there was a guy in America that had the same, did the same thing, and I, I remember hearing him do. He came into class once at Multnomah and he did um, something short like one Thessalonians, and then he did a chapel, did Hebrews, oh, Hebrews in an hour and ten minutes, so powerful, and then he did Revelation, two hours through the book of Revelation I mean, oh, I mean, if you're just sitting there with tears just pouring down your face because the word of God is powerful but we've got to learn to read it well you know and so if, if you're preaching don't just practice your sermon practice your reading you know think about ways to how to pause how to develop it maybe have two people do the reading you know if you've got uh, how about think of Mary, uh, the raising of Lazarus. 
You've got Mary's voice, you've got Martha's voice. Imagine having a female to read the female voice as the reading is, is read. That would be so much more powerful than my voice talking about Mary, you know, in the reading of it. So I think even thinking about the reading ahead of the message, we could do something a bit more creative there. And during the message, if you haven't got, you're not just going to work through the whole thing line by line, make sure you know where you're going to read. And like uh, Natalia said, make sure it's the key moments so that people can make the connection and then summarize the rest so they can see that you're accurate. Okay. What about the whole idea of telling the story? I remember some years ago there was a, a guy in England who came to our church and he was a very, very popular uh, teacher in one Bible college. And so everyone was excited that he was coming and he came and he preached John 2, the wedding at Cana. And he started his sermon, polite comments probably, and then he, he read it. And then he said, you all know the story, so I'm not going to tell the story again. Let's think about the theology of the story. And it was one of the worst sermons I've ever heard in my life. The things he made up. I mean, he was, he was going all over the place theologically, and his theology was completely broken. But I was just frustrated from the start. I was like, come on, tell us the story. God inspired the writing of that story. And again, it's this thinking of, no, adults don't need stories. We do. And actually telling the story so we can engage it and feel it is very important. Theology in action. Exactly. And if you dismiss the theology in action to give your theology, I'd, I'd rather not hear your theology, you know, if it's not coming from that. Yes. Yeah. I agree with whatever we get a familiar story from the Bible, we shouldn't say, oh, I didn't know it. You know, but then tell it in a way that gets rid of curiosity. But what's interesting, I found out, I, don't, I haven't discovered it myself, but I discovered somewhere that 75% of the Bible are stories. 75%. 15, 15 of Psalms and 10 percent exposition. So even in our preaching, we can use stories from the Bible. You know, which preachers today we use all kinds of relevant stories. There's a clear place for it, but there's a place to use biblical stories to illustrate the yeah. point. I mean, th- those those numbers are different from what I've seen, but I mean, it's still the, the point that you have. I would say, uh, maybe. 60 to 70 percent story it's it's a lot like you say it's the major major part and then poetry if you extend poetry beyond psalms to the prophets that's a big chunk as well and it doesn't leave much for epistles <laughs> and speeches but we treat we easily preach everything as if we're preaching an epistle and so take the text divide it into sections and make a point with each section but stories don't work that way you know, if you say to your friend, hey, have you seen that new film? Well, I saw the first third, and that was great. <laughs> what? Yeah, you know, I'm going to see the second third in a few weeks' time. That makes no sense. So you, the, the story holds together. You've got to get the whole thing. And so the same thing's true when you're preaching a story. Preach the story, tell the story, because it's story. God inspired the form. He didn't just inspire the content. He inspired the form of it as story. And so the power of, of that, like you said, Tom, is it's theology in action. This is, this is something that God thought was the best way to communicate this. And so the retelling of that story has several th- benefits. For a start, uh, we cannot assume that people know their Bibles. That's just crazy. In a, in a Western, kind of a, I say Western, I shouldn't say that. In a British-American kind of evangelical rooted country, people do not know their Bibles. In a Lutheran background country, no, it's, it may be part of the heritage, but it's not part of people's thinking. In a Catholic background country, uh, you know, if you haven't been to a Catholic church, they don't tend to tell Bible stories very much. So this is not an environment where you're getting Bible taught, and if you're obviously in a Muslim country or somewhere. And so there's, there's pretty much nowhere where you can say, well, you've heard the old story about Noah and his ark. Well, if they've watched the movie, they haven't seen the story of Noah and his ark. You know, they've seen a presentation of Gnosticism. So people don't have a biblical awareness. And so we've got to tell the story for that purpose, but also for people that do know the stories and have heard them before, 
they still need to feel the force of that story. I don't know how many times I heard the story of the prodigal son before I heard the story of the prodigal son and it absolutely gripped me. But I'd heard it probably 15 times before that and it was always, yeah, it's interesting. And then I suddenly saw it, I forget who it was that was preaching, but I went, oh my goodness, look at the significance of that for me. But if that person hadn't told the story and assumed that I knew it, his message wouldn't have had that impact. Okay, so we've got to be, we've got to develop the skill of storytelling as preachers. Yeah. Uh, another aspect is that there are many stories that uh, are going through the Bible, so the whole Bible. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and I observe that because of the very bad state of the Old Testament, where the people just sort of want what God cannot relate to God. Mm. They know the end of the story, but they don't know the beginning of mm. the story. And, um, and because of this, it's not that powerful. So just, just like John did uh, yesterday, the, the story of the city, so maybe uh, yeah. Yeah. That means that really that you can read that in the at uh, the end of the Bible, so you can die in the city. But it's, it's powerful if you know that where it began. Mm-hmm. It began anyway, so yeah. uh, and uh, and it makes the people love the Old Testament and yes. they understand that the New Testament is just more powerful because of the beginning. Absolutely. And one of the ways to access the Old Testament f- when you're preaching through John is his use of the Old Testament. Mm-hmm. And so, for example. Jesus and Nicodemus. Let's look at that for a minute. Because the, the text itself of John 3, it goes, you have the challenge of verse 16 to 21. Is this Jesus speaking to Nicodemus or is this John explaining? Right, and, and so if you have Bible with the red letter, sometimes the red stops at 15, sometimes it stops at 21 because it, it, we're not certain which way it goes it doesn't actually matter that much but there's a slight complexity there but let's say that the section uh, is that you're preaching is 1 to 21 okay, now you may argue and I think you'd be right that the rest of the chapter is still connected it's still part of the same flow but let's just say we're looking at 1 to 21 what Old Testament Influence is there in what's what's going on there? What are the Old Testament passages that are being quoted or referenced as Jesus speaks with Nicodemus? And remember, Nicodemus is the teacher of Israel. He knows his Old Testament, right? If if Nicodemus came to this conference, he could give some workshops and a whole network on Old Testament because he knew his Old Testament, right? So, what do we? Okay, so down in verse uh, fourteen, fifteen. As Moses lifted up the serpent, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So that's Numbers 21. Yeah, and Numbers 21, 6 to 9. Uh, Nicodemus starts with that no one can do this kind of signs. Yeah. So he refers to something that they were expecting from the Old Testament that happened. Okay, so it may not be a specific text, but an Old but Testament awareness. Yes. This kind of sign, this kind of miracle. Should be messed up. It yeah. should, be, yeah. should be divinely sourced yeah. somehow. Yep. Yeah. Uh, he's being born in uh, like spirit yeah. in water. It's uh, Ezekiel 33, is it? 34? Yeah, 36. 36. Yeah. <laughs> 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 keep going, keep going. Yeah, yeah so the. Uh, too bad he didn't know that. I mean, it seems like he didn't know. He was an expert in the Lord says, You are a teacher, the teacher of Israel. Yeah. And you Yep, they don't get the new covenant. And that, that um, where is it, verse 5. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. He's not talking about baptism there. That's a, that's a mistake that New Testament people make. Right? People that just read Matthew to Revelation and Matthew to Revelation. Water and the Spirit. Ah, that must be baptism and baptism in the Spirit. Probably not. Ezekiel 36. It, connects the two in terms of the new covenant where you're going to have not just sins forgiven but the spirit poured into people and uh, there's this kind of cleansing that God's going to do by his spirit giving you a new heart and Jesus is saying that's you've, you've got to have that if you don't have new covenant regeneration you have a problem and so uh, again that's 
how, do you have to refer to that when you're preaching this? Well, not necessarily, but you need to know it. You need to understand it. So if you're preaching to a group of students or you know, whoever, and it's a basically evangelistic, don't confuse them with Old Testament, New Testament. You know, that's, that's complex. But if you're in a church and you're trying to move people towards maturity, one way you could do that is you could preach John 3, 1 to 21, twice. Three times. Not dividing it up because it's one story, but preaching it, first of all, just kind of plain, as it stands, get the big point. And then come back to it again and say, okay, we've seen the big point. The big point is this. Let me summarize. Now, let's look and see what's going on behind the conversation. And you could do the same story again, but drop back with more detail into numbers, into Ezekiel, and, and drill into some of those things. Okay, so any others? Verse 13. No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Anyone know where? It's quoted in Romans 10. Which? The, uh, oh, the Son of Man is in yeah, Ezekiel a lot and Daniel 7. Okay, the ascended and descended. Jacob? Could be Jacob's ladder, but it seems to be actually a quote from Deuteronomy. Is it, I think, 27? Yes, yes. And so that's probably the main place you go. But it's, all of those would actually reinforce the same point. That, that we don't get there, he comes to us. You know, in Romans 10, Paul uses that passage quite strongly. So which in the Deuteronomy? Let me see if I can find it. I think it's Deuteronomy 27. So the fifth book of Moses for German speakers. Um, or 30, is it? Yeah, 30 verse 12. Deuteronomy 30 verse 12. There's another one here that I think is a big one that is in the background, but a lot of people miss it. That's Genesis 3. Because Nicodemus, remember how we said Nicodemus comes to Jesus saying, good teacher, how are you? Lovely to meet you. We'd like to give you a certificate, maybe get you in the newspaper. Could I have my picture taken with you? We really want to honor you. Here's a doctorate. You know, he's doing that whole kind of honor Jesus thing because he wants to control Jesus because he didn't handle John the Baptist or they didn't handle John the Baptist. So he's trying to get it right. And Jesus' response is so strong just dismisses him I mean if you were Jesus' PR public relations officer all right, Jesus, Nicodemus comes with this really high level introduction and then Jesus' response is truly truly I say to you unless one is born of water and the spirit he cannot enter the kingdom of God you would say okay wait 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 wait. excuse me Nicodemus I'm really sorry I just need to have a word with Jesus Jesus what are you doing you can't say that because it's really strong. He's saying to the teacher of Israel, sorry, I can't have a conversation with you about God because you're dead. Isn't he? Yeah. Unless you're born again, we, you're not alive. And so, can't talk to you. Sorry, moving on. Next. <laughs> I mean, Jesus really isn't engaging with Nicodemus at all. And I think that's the whole Genesis 3 tension in the background. In the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. No, you won't. Did God really say, come on, look, I'm still alive. Go on, the fruit's lovely, have some. And so they took the fruit, and did they die in the day that they ate of it? Yes. But they lived for years, physically. But they died spiritually. They lost, I would say, they lost the spirit. They, they lost the communion with God by the spirit, so they became completely self-oriented mini-gods who live in the illusion of being alive, right? Their bodies move, they choose what socks to wear. What more could there be? I must be alive, right? I go through a buffet at this hotel. I choose this, I don't choose that. I don't even recognize that one, but I, you know, I make choices, therefore I must be alive. But what does the Bible say? Spiritually alive or dead? We're all dead. And Jesus is clear on that, and Nicodemus isn't. And I think that is in the background here. It's not quoted, 
But it's interesting that you then have the serpent reference later, which numbers 21. Why was the serpent the image? Because it tied back to Genesis 3. It's always been the serpent image there anyway. So something to think about, that actually there's layer upon layer of Old Testament within these passages. You know, and if we could go to any passage and we'd see, we could start hunting for them. You know, there's always Old Testament behind it. And so the challenge for us as preachers is, first of all, to spot it, to recognize it, secondly, to understand it, and then thirdly, to communicate. Do we communicate it or does it confuse? Depends on your audience. But you, it means that you've got to have a level of understanding of John that isn't just what you get from looking at it on a Saturday evening to plan a sermon for Sunday morning. You, can't, you don't have the time to study it Saturday evening. You've got to take the time, like John Lennox said, for it to work its way into you, for you to chase down all these different avenues, and then from this mass of growing knowledge to say, right, now, back to the people I'm speaking to. I don't want to overwhelm them, but how can I help them understand this? Okay, so that's, that's just an example of, of that kind of thing. Where are we on our notes here? Uh, planning series. Um, I, we don't want to, I don't think we need to talk about this too much, but just a, a thought for us. I just made a suggestion with, with, say, John 3, that you could take the same story and preach it several times just to go deeper into it. All right, that's, that's an option. Another option, obviously, is to preach a series made up of the normal units. And so you could do John 1 to 4 over eight weeks, something like that, first, night, first 18 verses, the rest of John 1, wedding at Cana, temple cleansing, Nicodemus maybe to the end of the chapter or maybe divide that into two chapter 4 1 to 42 and then the, the man's son at the end that's about 8 weeks right? that would be a good series so you can do series like that that's the obvious way to do a series a suggestion with that kind of series is either at the beginning or at the end or both why not do a message that covers the whole section give people a sense that this actually holds together so they see maybe in that example how Cana and Cana first sign, second sign becomes a bookend and that in between you have a progression from unbelief to belief for Jews, unbelief to belief for Gentiles <coughs> there's that section having a, a message like that at the end instead of rushing somewhere else could help your people go oh, I see what's happening, and pull it together. Okay, so I don't, I don't think that's hard. I don't think it's strange. I just don't see many people doing it. Okay, a summary before and after. Which one. Um, the other option is to, to take a passage and to swim in it for a long time, like John 5. Can you preach John 5 in one message? Yeah. It's 47 verses. It's, you've got to move pretty quickly. You could divide it into... The healing, and then Jesus' first response, first part of his response, the life and judgment section, and then 30 to 47, the witnesses section. So that's a three-part you know, three series. You could spend longer on that last one. So, you know, we've got a, a variety of options here, but I, I was challenged by something Andy Stanley said, uh, who is a, a pastor in America, and and Andy Stanley's interesting in the sense that when he's good, he's very, very good. When he's not so good, it's like... Mm. But usually, maybe six times out of ten, when Andy Stanley preaches a passage, I think, I think that's the best I've heard. So, you know, he's consistently good. Uh, he made the comment that a lot of Christian church sermons would make a great series. But we try to cover too much. <laughs> and so instead of... You know, covering that and then next week covering that, why not make that a series over three, four, five weeks? And so that's a challenge with John because you cannot divide up stories and maintain the integrity of stories, but you can, if they're individual episodes, you can do it. If you have, uh, if you come back to and spend longer in a story, you can do it. I found in uh, one church where I was preaching for three years that I, they wanted me to preach morning and evening and 
and so I, I said okay well what I preach in the morning often I will come back to in the evening and so in the morning I preach a passage have maybe five minutes to kind of apply it at the end in the evening I summarize it and then develop the application and so it's less work but it's better for them because they're spending more time in the same passage and so the same kind of principle with, with what we're saying here if you take a section preach it one week the next week preach it again next week preach it again but but maybe go down some different avenues of application or one week look at the Old Testament that's behind it or whatever you know there's, there's, there's options we, we, I think sometimes we're just too predictable Oh, we're doing a series on John. Oh, it's going to be 21 messages, and everyone's going to feel rushed. <laughs> it doesn't need to be that way. So variety. And so you may have a series where at one week your section is just one verse, and another week the section is 70 verses. That's variety. <laughs> okay. Um, on the back of the page here, uh, let's just think about it for a few minutes the, we've talked about interwoven themes, just the fact that you get these different themes that kind of come together, and they're probably going to be 10 or 15 themes in every section that you preach in John. You might want to selectively highlight when you're preaching through a section. If you identify every single theme, <laughs> people will just be overwhelmed. But if you help them, if uh, it's kind of like a you know you take a cut a tree down and it falls down you can cut it into round what do you call those chunks of wood round pieces and you can see the rings within that section that's the way we tend to preach is we look at the rings within one section of a book but if you cut it the other way you can create planks of wood and then you see the grain right and the grain comes all the way through and it's a different use of wood and it's equally beautiful if it's handled properly in our preaching we very rarely do that we rarely show the grain that's going from beginning to end and so one thing you could do is say I'm going to preach from John and I'm going to preach themes you know, so do a message on glory you ha it's hard because you, you're touching down in lots of places you have to be selective but if people can get a taste of the glory theme belief light and dark, truth, the word, father, son. I mean, if you, if you have the skill, you could make a great series there. That's one approach. Another approach is when you're in your passage, you've got these grains coming through, and there's lots of them, you may just select these two and say, now, we've seen these two before, and give a couple of examples. Notice how those, those themes are working their way through this story and preach on the theme as part of the whole that's just a different I'm trying to get us to think creatively there's different ways instead of just story by story okay so you've got interwoven themes the prologue let's leave that for now that's the one thing I would say about the prologue the first 18 verses is some people get into a real mess with Greek stuff logos and all of the kind of logos ideas in philosophy it doesn't actually help you explain John. So just be careful that you stay, let John determine what you're saying and let the themes that are there develop. What about the conversation? Let's take the last few minutes and think about conversations. Jesus has a conversation with Nicodemus in chapter 3, with the woman at the well in chapter 4, with his accusers in chapter 5, with a crowd in chapter 6, with his disciples a little bit, uh, it's less of a conversation in 7, a huge conversation in 8 with people that believed in him but then tried to stone him, uh, with the leaders of the nation at the start of chapter 10, with Mary and Martha in chapter 11, and then with Andrew and Philip who are trying to get Jesus to hear their question about the Greeks. That's more of a speech in 12. 13, he has a conversation with, with the disciples and Judas and Peter. So there's a lot of conversations, some of them short, some of them quite long. There's a conversation with Peter in chapter 21. There's a lot of conversation. We don't get that in Matthew, Mark, Luke. You get little moments. But in John, it's like the gospel of conversations. We get to sit and listen to Jesus chatting to people. Dialogue. Dialogues. How do you preach dialogue? What, what are some of the challenges and what, what can you do to make it work? What do you think? <laughs> 
What's the potential problem? Yeah? So we may not understand what's happening. Yeah? Yeah, anything else? The people who think it's not authentic what's in them, they're not the idiots. They have different problems, they have different yeah. approach to life. Yeah, it can feel a bit yeah. irrelevant yes. and also a bit uninteresting, mm-hmm. you know, compared to a miracle. <laughs> you know, if a man is, if you're as a preacher and there's a guy in the story who doesn't walk and his friends carry him and drop him through a roof to get to Jesus and then Jesus says up you get and he gets up and walks and you know that's a dream for a preacher because you're telling a story that's it's engaging it's exciting there's a man who's dead in a tomb and Jesus came late but then Jesus calls and he walks out (laughs) for a preacher if you are good at explaining and telling stories miracles are kind of easy the challenge is how do you preach the relevance of them but they're quite easy to tell but telling the story of a conversation you know, you just think about um, the times where someone tells you, oh, I spoke to this person, I said this, he said that, 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 and you're, di- you're ready to die because it's just boring. It's just boring. Just imagine yeah. if, like, hearing Revelation for two hours and that guy who used the same tonality. That's boring. Yeah. So I think it's the same thing with a preacher preaching a dialogue. He needs to identify himself with each character and when he express uh, the words, just express the tonality of, the, of yeah. that person. The tone and all, yeah. And you can also explain as, as well. I think if we just repeat the words, that's dull. But if you, you can kind of fill in the story. That's one of the challenges for us as a preacher. So with Nicodemus, I, I would be tempted to use John 4 as my example here because it's such a great example. But you're doing that next session, so I'll leave that. But, but in John 3 with Nicodemus... I'm filling in the background when I say that Nicodemus is really being nice to Jesus and honoring him to try to help people to see the motivation to then feel the shock of Jesus' pushback. And then you talk about the confusion. You know, he must be born again. Born again? How can a man enter into his mother's womb for a second time? I, what? You, you have to get people to, to feel the tension and the drama as it unfolds because actually every conversation is dramatic. It's not, here's a shopping list, okay, thank you. It's, it's real drama. But as we're preaching, we've got to find a way to do that. It doesn't mean we put on a woman's voice or you know, make our voice deeper. It doesn't have to be acted to be dramatic, but we have to make sure people feel the tension within that drama. Was that a hand? Now, how would you use your body language in this? Uh, would you step a little bit in the left when talking about Jesus? You, in the right you could do. Yeah, I mean, when I preached um, the pilot trial, I, I moved this here just briefly, but I did the whole sermon outside, inside, outside, inside, because there's a there's a geographic shift when when Jesus is or when Pilate's talking to Jesus and when Pilate's talking to the Sanhedrin, the rulers, and so I sometimes you can be very deliberate physically, um, but I think it's just helpful in your own mind, and this is true for any narrative thing, that any storytelling you've got to see it if you see it then you don't have to think about body language in a sense because if in my mind there's Jesus and Nicodemus and Nicodemus says this and Jesus says this I'm always going to refer to Nicodemus and to Jesus and my body language is going to naturally make it into this two-part conversation but I don't think about Nicodemus uh, Jesus you see what I mean? It's not a technique. It's just that as a communicator, if I can't see what I'm describing, then the listeners will not see what I'm describing. If I can see it in my mind, if I can see the look on Nicodemus's face and see the look on Jesus's face, and I can see the body language of both of them, if I'm living in that, then as I tell that story, the listeners are going to start to see it themselves. And I think that's where narrative preaching gets powerful. And we'll think about that more tomorrow. But when we can... If we imagine that our listeners have a screen, like a a wall here, in their hearts, and it's smoke-covered, the way for that smoke to clear and an image to form is if we describe well. If we can see it, we will describe it effectively, 
we will express the tension and the emotion and the drama just in the way that we speak. And gradually, within a few minutes, the smoke clears and they're watching the movie. And when you feel like you're watching the movie, you could be listening to brilliant, uh, awesome preaching. You may not be. It may be complete heresy. It's not as simple as that. But if somebody really is preaching the text well, and what they say about it is theologically accurate and historically accurate, then actually being able to see it happening in their imaginations is, I think, where the power occurs, where there's the grip on people's lives. That's where you get people leaning on the edge of their seat in a, in a story that they know the end to. But they're, they're excited to know what happens or to feel what happens again. So I think that's something we need to think about. And when you go next session into John 4, recognize this is not a conversation with a woman that's there to give us some theological statements. There's a drama in the conversation. Okay, and if you can work out that drama, you will be able to preach it much, much better.